in recessions, the average decline in earnings is about 20%. This time around though, because we're coming off record high profit margins, I'm worried that it could be more than that. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder, Adam Taggart. 2022 has seen an erosion in asset prices that has caught investors and governments alike by surprise. Stocks and bonds are having one of their worst ever years so far, and now the housing market suddenly looks vulnerable too. And those hoping for a reversal of fortune soon may be disappointed. Because just a few hours ago, European Central Bank President Christine Lagarde warned that the risk of an abrupt correction on Europe's financial and housing markets is, quote, severe. Wow, that's a frighteningly frank statement from the bureaucrats famous for saying, quote, when it becomes serious, you have to lie. To help us make sense of what lies ahead for the economy and the markets, we welcome back Peter Bookvar, Chief Investment Officer at Bleakley Financial Group, back to the program. Peter, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Adam. I appreciate uh, you having me on. Oh, gosh. It's a total pleasure, Peter. Really enjoyed your first appearance uh, about a month ago. Um, looking forward to this conversation and hopefully many more going forward. Um, we've got a lot of questions here for you, but if we can, let's just start way up at a high level. What is your current assessment of today's global economy and financial markets? Well, with, with the benefit of hindsight, what we've seen over the past 20 plus years is markets in the economy do okay and do, do well when the central banks are easing and cost of capital is cheap and the liquidity is flowing and then it reverses when they tighten monetary policy. And we're just sort of getting a rerun of the same movie, the same thing we've seen many times before. Uh, so essentially this is just another sequel. And I don't think you needed to be um, much of a soothsayer to know that when you got inflation running at 40 year highs, that this time would be somewhat more pronounced in terms of its uh, correction and reversal and response of central bankers. You know, for 20 plus years, inflation has been low, as we know, statistically speaking, uh, that, that the government reports. But having that be the background allowed central bankers to do as they pleased on the easing side and on the tightening side. And having inflation run at the extent that it has sort of changed the tune. And while I do say this is a sequel, uh, this is a sequel with some more scarier characteristics and that being inflation and, and the rapid pace at which central banks are now responding. So we have another example of the Fed and other central banks inflating asset prices to try to deal with an economic slowdown, whether it was COVID or is in the mid 2000s or it was post tech bubble burst. And now we are seeing the tightening because of the uh, inflation story that we now are experiencing, but off a base of very high asset prices and an economic foundation that was built on cheap money, debt and so on. So that is why we're seeing, um, I think, the, the rapid decline in, in equity prices and now a global talk of uh, recession. All right. So it really is, at the end of the day, all about monetary policy um, within the confines of what inflation uh, is doing. Um, so, you know, Fed easing, great. Party on. <laughs> Fed tightening. Uh, it's a lot less fun. Um, I, I, I'm curious. And, 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 um, and sorry, yeah, to the reason why I say that is because this type of monetary behavior has, has created credit cycles where the economy ebbs and flows with the cost of capital. I mean, there used to be before Greenspan, uh, you know, pool of savings that drove investment and drove economic growth. That's what you learn in school is savings equal investment. And it's been reversed where the movement of lower interest rates to encourage you to borrow, whether you're a household or a business, is what has driven economic behavior. So that, that's why I, I, I tie in the behavior of central banks and, and the cost of money 
so intertwined to asset prices and economic activity. That's a great clarity. It, would it be fair to say we, we, we moved from an era of, of natural business cycles to an era of sort of unnatural credit cycles? That's exactly what we are in. And, and you know, I started this by saying, you know, we've seen this movie before because that's what's happening, obviously in a more pronounced way and under different circumstances, but it's, it's the easing of monetary policy that causes sort of the boom, the tightening of it that causes the bust. To contrast with the business cycle, uh, you know, just like the seasons, right, the, the, you have sort of a boom bust to, to business cycles as well. Um, the, the bust is to basically get rid of all the, the malinvestment, the, the, the bad companies that, that aren't sustainably profitable and whatnot. And then you, you start anew again, the new economic spring and you, you're back off to the races. Uh, in a credit cycle, because you're monkeying around with the price of money, you create this artificial boom um, until you get to conditions that sort of force uh, the system out of the, the central planner's hands a little bit. Um, and, and then they basically have to step in because they, they increasingly distort the system. And the more they distort it, the more the, the pain that the bust is going to be. So what happens is you get these, these increasingly larger and larger interventions to try to keep the system from, from right-sizing because the central planners have distorted it so much. And Peter, these are my words. They don't have to be your words. Feel free to correct me in anything that you're, you're seeing here. But where I'm kind of going with this is you, you almost get this diminishing returns with these credit cycles because uh, it's almost like climbing a ladder. Um, the, the, the higher you go, uh, the, the more painful the fall could be at the end um, if you just let gravity itself take over. And we found that more and more as the Fed eases when it has its easing campaigns, the resulting economic growth we get from that isn't as much as, as we had in the previous up credit cycle. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm, I'm making the argument that these credit cycles kind of have an expiration date on them at some point because they can't go on forever. Do you agree with what I just said there? You're basically defining the law of diminishing returns yes. and why over the past 40 years, each incremental, each rate hiking cycle ended at a level below the previous peak of rate hiking cycles. Because of the growing sensitivity that the economy has been uh, dependent on to cheaper and cheaper money in order to sustain itself. Again, rather than using that pool of savings, we've, re we've, re we've relied on leverage. Because at the end of the day, just think about what monetary policy is. It doesn't grow the economic pie. All it does is just move around the pieces and alters the timing of economic activity. Right. So from a household perspective, it's telling a family, I know you wanna save up 20% for that, that, that down payment, but if I lower your monthly payment through a lower mortgage rate, how about only saving up 10% and you can borrow less, but because I'm lowering mortgage rates, your monthly payment won't be that much different. And the same thing with an automobile. And then of course, with companies, they try to stimulate the capital markets, with, and which then feeds capital into the private sector and companies get financing and so on and so on. The problem with, with everything is on the business side, one of the faulty um, consequences is while it helps the capital markets and those companies that have access to it, the small and medium-sized businesses that need to rely on that local bank, that local community bank for a loan, well, that bank doesn't have a capital markets business. They do business the old fashioned way of taking in deposits and lending it out and collecting a spread. Well, in the old days, and I say the old days pre-Greenspan, that spread was maybe 300 basis points. But when you lower the cost of capital, when you lower um, the yield curve as much as you do and flatten it, that distorts the profitability of these small banks and then it inhibits lending to small and medium-sized businesses. The point is, is that all monetary policy does is take forward behavior. So to your point, once you've taken forward so much behavior, you then have a hangover because there's no other behavior left to stimulate because you've already done it. And all you have to do is look at the Japanese experience where they think that zero interest rates, negative interest rates is somehow stimulative, but it stopped being stimulative 
a long time ago. The regional banking system has been almost killed off in Japan. And when rates are low forever, you don't create any pool of savings of substance because people right. aren't encouraged to save. And you take away that sense of urgency. And that's why one of the other uh, uh, mistakes of central banks was this concept of forward guidance and their idea that it was stimulative. Them by telling us we're going to keep rates low for a long period of time, thinking that that would somehow stimulate behavior, but it doesn't. It does the exact opposite. It, like I said, it kills off banking margins. And from a urgency standpoint, well, I don't need to do something today because I can just wait till tomorrow because the cost of capital isn't changing anytime soon. Right. So therefore, it loses its luster law diminishing returns, it's no longer stimulative, and you can argue it's actually restrictive counterintuitively. Right, right. Well, and, and the big reason for that, right, is, is the, the productivity hit, you're pulling future productivity into today. So it's stimulative in the immediate term, but then that debt is forever out there until it's, it's paid off, right? And so as that debt builds over time, it becomes depressive, actually. So, um, all right, so uh, look, I, I think we're singing from the same song sheet here. That, and and, and yeah. one last thing to take it a step further is that the lower the Fed funds rate ends up being after that hiking cycle, the less tools they have to then stimulate at the next downturn. Very good, exactly, yeah. They, they, they have less and less room to run uh, every time they go through one of these cycles. So, so basically the main point here is it's, it's th these interventions are distortive you could, some might call them perversive. Uh, they definitely end in um, what I think many people might say unfair distribution of how ca capital gets allocated. Um, but most importantly, this thing has an expiration date, right? That this, this is not a sustainable system. It gets to a point upon which it, it can't continue. And so the, the key thing I wanna just drill home for everybody before we get into the specific questions here, Peter, is you said this has been going on since around the Greenspan time, so more or less 40 years or so, right? Which is, there are a few people who are professionally active, uh, who have been professionally active for longer than 40 years, right? So this system that we all know is, we may assume is gonna be around forever because it's kind of all we know, like a fish is in water and just assumes the water is always gonna be there. But it really is a system that that can't sustain forever. And we may be getting near its terminus. We can debate how close to it we are, but um, it's it, it's not eternal. Um, and we need to be aware of that so that we can not get caught by surprise when when the end date arrives. Um, all right, so let's let's bring this down to you know relevance to today, Peter. So central banks around the world are tightening in what I believe you've called a synchronized tightening program here. Um, I, I want to kind of dig into what, what the implications are going to be, because you, you started all this by saying, um, you know, times tend to be fun when the central banks are easing and, and less fun when they're tightening. Well, now they're suddenly all tightening here and uh, interest rates are going up and cost of capital is going up. So how, I, I guess at a high level, how high do you think rates can go here? So in the short end of the yield curve and looking at the U U.S. Treasury market, uh, right now, the terminal rate, we're pricing in about a 375 Fed funds rate uh, this time next year. And getting to the point of monetary policy and the Fed funds rate ending at a point below the previous peak, getting to, and, and the previous peak being two and a quarter, two and a half in the fourth quarter 2018, getting to 375 would be quite an achievement for the Fed. Uh, such an achievement, I don't think that that will be achieved. I think maybe they get to three tops uh, in, in, in terms of the Fed funds rate, which if you assume that goes 75 basis points again in July, that'll take them to call two and a quarter, two and a half, and maybe they squeeze in another two of 25 or 50 thereafter, because I think that the, the economic slowdown and, and the market disruption will be enough to cause them to pause. So that's the short end. So I'd be buying, and we are at our firm, buying the two-year note all day long here. Now it is well below the rate of inflation. You're getting a negative return on a real basis as a result, but from a nominal interest rate standpoint, I think the two-year is a good purchase. Now, further out on the curve, I was pretty confident of a rise in rates up to around this point. And three and a quarter was, my always my level in my mind because that was the peak in November 2018 
the last time the Fed was both raising interest rates and reducing the size of their balance sheet. So we, we got to that, we traded above it, we got to almost three and a half last week. The difficulty in trying to figure out where the tenure goes from here is on one side, you obviously have the, 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 the recession that is either here or we're on the cusp of, not just in the US, but globally, that will be a suppressant on longer term interest rates. But on the other hand, you have the Fed doing QT. At the same time, foreigners have reduced their purchases of US treasuries. US banks are already loaded up with treasuries and MBS. So we need another cycle of buyers to sort of take the place. It's very uncertain as to where European bond rates go, because I've also said for a while, you cannot just analyze and forecast US growth and inflation and come to uh, a prediction of where the 10-year yield goes. You have to understand that this global bond bubble, sovereign bond bubble, and that's what it's been over the past couple of years, is global. And that where European yields go will drive where US rates go. What happens with Japanese yield curve control from here will determine where the 10-year yield goes. So having that influence makes it tough to figure out where long rates go because of all these interacting influences. Now, if you held my feet to the fire, I would say that the tenure still can go to 4%, not because things are so great economically, but because inflation is sticky and central banks continue to lose control of the bond market. I mean, I, I just wonder if we come in one day and the Bank of Japan says we're, we're widening yield curve control to 75 basis points or maybe 50, then to 75, well, you have to believe that there's going to be another round of global bond selling if that were to happen. Uh, you look at Europe, which is squeezed now between having to tighten monetary policy because they've so bungled this and, and their inflation call. But at the same time, let's just say Italian yields continue to blow out against German uh, yields. Right now, they're about, well, they peaked at about 225 last week before they, they, they've come in. Uh, they, they were as high as 500 basis points. When uh, before Draghi said whatever it takes, but that's also a big influence here too as well in where long end rates go. So it's much more trickier for here and trying to call that. That's why I'm I'm mostly confident on the short end and less on the longer end from this point on. Okay, and you know central banks have much more control on the short end. They really don't control the long end all that much. So yeah, right. that, that that I think is where we can have more confidence. Um, all right, so uh, look, rates going higher then, at least in, in, in the near term, uh, sounds like you are saying, don't think the Fed's gonna get to 375, but they can maybe get to three. That'll be at some point, likely this year, um, maybe near the end. Uh, so, you know, we, looks like in the near term, at least, tightening uh, and economic deceleration is gonna be the name of the game for most of the rest of this year. Um, and I'm, I'm working my way up to a question for you. I think you've already nodded your head here on it, but um, is what do you think the odds of recession are and, and how pronounced a recession do you think it's gonna be? But before we get to that, let me just talk about um, some shoes that may fall along the way. Um, one is we're already having, we're already seeing a correction of, of asset prices, um, certainly in the financial markets and then now potentially in the housing markets. Um, you've written some pieces recently about coming margin contraction um, as, you know, uh, the price inflation that we're seeing squeezes profit margins, as well as the increase in the cost of capital that corporations are having to deal with. So that is another shoe yet to drop here because forward earnings estimates are still, I think, you know, in La La Land. In La La Land. <laughs> I was trying to find a politer way to say that. Um, so let's, I guess, let's start there. So let's, let's talk about the, the potential um, overvaluation that, that still remains in the financial markets, even though they've, they've had one of their worst starts you know, ever, if you combine the performance of stocks and bonds together so far this year. Um, how material is this margin contraction going to be, do you think? I think it's uh, tremendous because it's coming off a very high level. For the last couple of quarters, we've seen some regression in profit margins, and this is off record high. So when you think about, at the end of the day, the three things that, that really move stock prices, it's what's the multiple you're going to pay on that level of earnings, 
which is driven by your top line and your profit margin. Well, we've seen obviously degradation in profit margin, I'm sorry, in, in P multiples. Uh, we've seen the S&P come in from 21, 22, down to 16 on La La Land earnings. Uh, we've seen the last couple of quarters of fallen profit margins, which I expect to continue. And with a recession, you are going to see a slowdown of note in revenue growth. And when you combine all of that, you have a very difficult uh, investing environment. Now, in recessions, the average decline in earnings is about 20%. This time around, though, because we're coming off record high profit margins, I'm worried that it could be more than that. And that's something that we have to pay attention to because let's just say, and I'm going to be generous here, uh, earnings estimates of 225, 230, we clipped them by 10%. And that's less than what is average. So you get to $200. Well, you, what if you have a 15 multiple on that? Well, that's a 3,000 S&P. What happens if the pendulum swings so much in the other direction? You go 14 times. Well, that's 2,800. Well, what happens if 200 is really 180? You know, so when you start to do these numbers, you get these, these range of outcomes that, um, at least for the S&P 500, and I'm defining that generally, which we know is still dominated by technology stocks, uh, the investing environment is still going to remain very difficult uh, with these realities. All right. Um, okay. So very well said. So that's that's one shoe that looks like it's still yet to drop here. Um, I guess one of the questions is, is what's the timeline where we think we're going to see this margin compression um, happen over? Uh, and I guess I'll just ask you that. Is that something we're going to see starting, you know, the coming quarter, or is this not something we're going to see until later on in the year or, or next year? Oh, it's here. We we saw it in Q1. We saw it beginning in Q4. And when we get Q2 earnings in the second week of July, you're going to hear a lot about it. And not just for the second quarter, but, but for the guidance that companies are going to give for Q3 and Q4. And it's just natural. I mean, you, you can go down the P&L of any company. Okay, we know that the largest expense is labor and labor costs have only gone up to a substantial degree, whether that is an hourly worker, less so for sort of supervisory people, but still going up and in the aggregate going up of note. Uh, you obviously look at raw materials, cost of goods sold, transportation costs, they've all gone up. And now you have interest expense going up. Now, those companies that have turned out their debt and don't necessarily have anything due. 22, 23, uh, they can be okay on that line item. But look at all the smaller companies that have uh, bank loans and floating rate debt. Uh, even Verizon, which is a stock that we own, uh, in the first quarter, they said that just the change in interest rates raised their interest expense by $150 million because of the floating rate debt portion of their capital structure. Well, and this is a big company. So you're going to hear a lot of that of companies that even if floating rate is a small piece of their 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 um, bond portion of their capital structure, uh, this very sharp move could could be uh, could be another thing that clips uh, net profits. It's obviously below the EBITDA line, but it's still going to drive uh, EPS possibly lower for those that either don't hedge or were too nonchalant with uh, uh, terming out their debt and fixed rate. Okay, so because companies theoretically share prices are a function of the forward earnings of the companies, uh, you're making a really good case that that forward earnings are going to get marched downwards really soon, like in this next round of earnings calls. So um, I'm, I'm I'm underscoring this because you know there is somewhat of a mentality out there amongst people who are saying, oh, hopefully, okay, the markets have already dropped, you know. To their bottom, and 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 hopefully we're going to pick back up again here. You're making a really important case that no, no, there's a catalyst that we can have pretty good confidence in that's coming up in the near term that should justify lower valuations ahead. I, I think in the very short term, and I'm I'm saying through the first few weeks of July until we see those earnings. Yep. Maybe we're we're going to probably get a, an oversold bounce here, but it's a bounce heading into what I think will be a tough earnings season. So now maybe we don't bounce, but I think we're due for a bounce. But I, I think the, the next catalyst for a rollover 
uh, will be second quarter earnings. Okay, which is, you know, at this point, less than a full month away from now. So it's pretty near term. Right. Um, all right, I want to bring up a chart here too that you mentioned. Um, uh, it's a chart of net worth to disposable income, which you're using as sort of a proxy for the assets to uh, asset prices to GDP ratio, um, sort of a you know, variant of the uh, the Buffett indicator here. Um, but really interestingly, you say at 818% that this is the level the Fed is tightening into after first inflating it there. And it compares with 649% in Q406 and 615% in March of 2000. So basically saying um, we are still at today's current price levels more overvalued um, using this metric than we were going into the GFC correction or going into the dot-com correction. Correct. And, and to my point I made earlier is that this is sort of the macro backdrop. And as you said, at which the Fed is now tightening it. So we can criticize the Fed for easing way too much for way too long, not acknowledging inflation and now being late to tighten. But the other error was while they were easy for too long as they inflated asset prices again. And I think that chart and those ratios really define the extent at which they have so much greater than the two previous bubbles of the, the tech and, and, and housing ones. Uh, whereas for years, we've heard about the every, everything bubble. And I think this chart sort of captures mm -hmm. what that actually means. And this, as you can also see in the chart, it doesn't necessarily mean revert uh, so easily, but it at least comes off that, that sugar rush high. And we are only just beginning to come off that sugar rush high. All right. So, all right. So we've made the case here that, um, that profits are going to be lower going forward because of margin contraction, and that should argue for lower prices. We just made the case that from a, an overvaluation standpoint, we've got more froth in the system still uh, than we've had before, and that most likely that's going to have to come out of prices here. Um, I want to now talk about bond spreads. So bond spreads are, are blowing out worldwide. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing that really kind of everywhere. Um, we're seeing it definitely with high yield debt here in the U.S. Um, you know, in, in Italy, uh, we're definitely seeing bond spreads um, be very quickly uh, repriced there, which, which is kind of my main point here, which is that risk itself is now being repriced in this market. Um, after years and years of, of zero interest rate policy or record rock bottom low interest rate policy, people got complacent around risk and suddenly they are now demanding higher yields. Um, and so my, my question here is what are the implications of this? Because when you have risk repricing like this, uh, I'm going to borrow a term from Stephanie Pomboy. Um, you, you start seeing bodies float to the surface of the companies that were just too dangerously over leveraged, but it didn't kind of matter when debt was so darn cheap. But now that it's not, it becomes a fatal blow to those over leveraged players. Well, so let, let's take a small company, okay? Um, you, you don't necessarily have full access to the capital market. So the, the, the most, you, you can't sell a junk bond. But you can get a loan from a bank that then um, securitizes it, sells it into a CLO. So really, your, your debt on your books are floating rate. Now, you can enter swaps with banks, and you can sort of hedge that out and, and, and create more of a, a fixed bag uh, of maturities. But there's going to be a portion that is going to be floating. And you didn't enter this year budgeting a 250 basis point increase in interest rates uh, and, and, and then translating to much higher interest expense. So at the same time, your growth rate is slowing because the economy is slowing and how are you gonna generate enough cash flow to meet the interest expense? So to Stephanie's point about bodies coming to the surface, that is one example. Uh, also, we've seen in crypto, certainly bodies coming to the surface. Uh, we've seen, companies that were trading at 40 times sales, where in the, in the tech bubble in the late 90s, 10 times was considered a, a really egregious price to sales ratio. And those bodies are coming to the surface. 
So, and, and, and this has not just an effect on one stock price. I mean, if you're Peloton, and you know, I don't wanna rain on, on Peloton, but let's just take that company and you shower your employees with stock options. Uh, I, I don't know for sure whether they you know, use option-based, stock-based compensation. So now that they have to start actually paying people a salary and less in stock options because people don't necessarily want stock options, that raises their sg a line and that changes the economics of their business in terms of their cost structure. There's so many um, real world instances of not just the decline in asset prices, but what that means for actual economic activity. And let's just take the consumer, for example, which we know is the dominant part of, of, of growth. Uh, you have 70% lower, of GDP, right? Right, you have a lower end that's getting squeezed by uh, higher inflation and their cost of living is skyrocketing. The standard of living is going down. So they've become very sensitive to, to this and, and they don't have the benefit of, of rising stock prices for the last 10 years. And, and they're literally meet buying private label at the supermarket because they, 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 they want to budget better against um, rising prices of, of brand names. And then you have the upper end that did benefit from rising asset prices that while they may still be able to make that purchase, they may now say, well, my portfolio is down 20%, my tech portfolio is down 40, maybe I'll defer that extension on my house, that boat, that ex uh, vacation, instead of going first class, maybe I'll go you know, economy plus or business class, for example. And that is more of a psychological impact, but that has real world uh, uh, economic impacts. So all this happening at the same time uh, is going to result in a recession. Now you look at 1987 with the stock market crash that didn't lead to a recession because it was because we, we had much lower debt levels. Greenspan responded quickly. We weren't as asset price dependent. There was a bigger pool of savings. There was these, these, these sort of there was, these- there was, there was no inflation limiting what, what Greenspan could do. Right. It's like right now, we have no shock absorbers. We are out in the ocean without life preservers in a way. And that the boat that can eventually bring the life preserver is so far away that I don't know if it's going to get to you in time. Right. And to just murder the analogy, uh, the boat is riding lower on the water than it ever has before. <laughs> right. Yeah, it, 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 it can it can take much less rough seas before it gets swamped here. Um, yeah. All right. So uh, we're, we're really getting close to the the, infl the recession question. Um, but there's one more important shoe that that could drop here. And you just sort of listed a whole bunch of reasons why consumer spending is likely to shrink here because consumers are feeling less wealthy, right? Sort of a negative wealth effect. So, you know, you can argue that the financial market asset prices actually don't matter as much as other factors because stocks and bonds are so unevenly owned, right? Something like the top 10% of households own like 90% of them, something pretty close to that. Um, so an asset like housing is much more widely owned, right? And housing prices, no surprise to anybody, uh, have been bid up to record high levels. You know, some would, would call pretty ridiculous levels in certain markets. Um, and uh, they, as crazy as they've been, they're not, you know, uh, completely divorced from the, the laws of supply and demand. And we have seen the cost of capital in that market double, right? We've seen 30-year fixed mortgage rates more than double now from last August to, to today. Um, they just cracked above 6% last week. Um, so uh, there's a very mathematical, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not behavioral, it's a mathematical relationship between how much house you can afford based upon what the cost of your mortgage is. So um, you would think that housing prices would come down as a result and we are seeing an extremely fast cooling happen on the housing market right now. It's still very early days, but we're seeing uh, all of a sudden, um, you know, uh, houses uh, listings stay on the market for a lot longer, a lot more listings coming on as people try to sell their homes. Um, we're seeing, uh, I got a stat here, um, 
Uh, housing market is cooling as an estimated 25% of home listings cut their asking prices. I mean, we cut cutting asking, asking prices. I mean, we haven't heard that for years and years at this point. Um, so mortgage applications are down. Um, so we're, we're, we're seeing all of a sudden a lot of really darkening storm clouds in the housing market, which, as I mentioned earlier, is an asset class that is much more widely owned uh, by the populace out there. So how important do you see what's going on in the housing market uh, is to the risk of recession? So with the homeownership rate, give or take, call it 65 percent. Our interview with Peter will continue over in part two, which will be released on this channel tomorrow as soon as we're finished editing it. To be notified when it comes out, subscribe to this channel if you haven't already by clicking on the subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. And be sure to hit the like button too while you're down there. Last, if the challenging macro outlook Peter has detailed in this interview has you feeling a little vulnerable about the prospects for your wealth, then consider scheduling a free, no strings attached portfolio review by a financial advisor who can help you manage your wealth while keeping in mind the trends and risks that Peter's mentioned in this interview. Just go to Wealthion.com and we'll help you set one up. Okay, I'll see you next in part two of our interview with Peter Bookvar. Thank you.